welcome to Zoom with Chazoom for Joyful Living. I'm Lulua Chazoom. I have self-healed from multiple chronic health issues and from trauma through the tools of music, dance, and lifestyle medicine. Along the way, I've had a grand adventure and I've met incredible people. I am excited to share all of this with you now so that no matter what you're facing, you have tools for bringing joy into your life and the lives of people around you. Chazoom for Joyful Living. I'm Lulua Chazoom. I am delighted to welcome my first guest to this series, Dr. Michael Finkelstein. We worked together for about three years when I was running my PR company. He is one of my all-time favorite clients to the point that when we first met and we were talking on the phone, I was so excited by his thinking around health and wellness that I was literally dancing in my office while we talked. What I really resonated with, which Michael, I would love you to share with people today, is that I had debilitating chronic pain following a hit and run head-on car collision in 1997. And for years, I was running around looking at what is broken and how do I fix it? And the turning point for me was when I had this epiphany to stop doing that and instead look at what makes me feel good? What makes my body feel comfortable? What brings me joy? What helps me transcend or transform the experience of pain? I started making lists of those things on the spiritual level, the emotional level, the physical level, and I started doing more and more of that, and everything changed when I turned that corner. But Michael, people don't think of that as medicine. They think of pharmaceuticals. They think of surgery, especially when they have something like debilitating chronic pain or cancer, which I've since been healing through music, which people think is so weird. So please talk to that, this, this major paradigm shift of what is health and what is medicine? So it's, it's such an important question. I think it's the first one people should be asking when let's say they realize they don't feel as well as they would like to, and they wanna get someplace else. And of course they wanna feel better, but the, trip, the, the, the journey where we're heading, what we want to achieve has to be really clear in our minds for us to get there. So if health is merely the absence of disease, as Western medicine would define it, then we just want to get rid of our high blood pressure. Let's say something simple. So pills could do that just really great. And that's really simple. But does that really make you a healthy person? When I started my work as an internist, following the, you know, my learning in typical universities in the United States about medicine, that's what it was. In my practice, after about 10 or 12 years, I realized as much as I was helping people with things like their blood pressure and other numbers and other targets, like getting rid of, let's say, more complicated disease syndromes with pharmaceuticals or surgical procedures, when I looked at a person and I asked them, do you feel as well as you could? Are you as healthy as you would like? very often the answer was no. Their blood pressure, their cholesterol, their heart disease was better, their cancer was better, but they were still not well. So health clearly is a little bit broader than just the absence of disease. And that's the difference in the paradigm. And so if you believe that, that my, my body matters a lot in terms of whether I can be healthy, but it's not the only thing that matters, then you start to ask other questions, like what else is going on? What other parts of me need some type of healing? Or how do I restore wholeness? In fact, the word health comes from the Anglo-Saxon root word, halen, which means whole. And so essentially another model of it all is to think of pieces that need to be put together, assembled with enough completion to revolve, to, to really create the life that feels whole to us. Uh, in my book, Slow Medicine, then I developed this slow medicine wheel of health, which is a seven spoked wheel, where each spoke represents an, an aspect of our lives, our physical body being one of it, but our mental, emotional health, our connection to other people, to nature, to the divine, to our communities, and to a sense of our purpose in life. These are the elements that I think are the sine qua non of health. And therefore, 
when somebody like you just described starts putting together the pieces in these other areas, health emerges, wholeness emerges. The body actually can heal itself better when those other forces are in play. And so people often think, I'll go to a doctor first, I'll get rid of the, you know, the scary thing, and then I'll get back to my life. Many more people these days are thinking about it in reverse, which is let me reestablish the foundation of my life, then maybe things sort of heal on their own. And I think even more people are doing both. There's no reason to do one or the other, uh, although that could be personal preference. But the idea is to think of all the different parts of what makes a good soup. You know, you wouldn't leave out the salt necessarily if you want to make a good soup. Um, so you need all the critical elements. Otherwise, it's not going to be the tastiest dish. And our life be compared to that. And that leads to one of the things I love that you say to your patients, or you ask your patients is, why do you want to be healthy? Yeah. And that's such a profound question. Or why do you want to be alive? Why, why do you want to be doing this thing here? And, and that you lead with that. So yes, maybe because of a disability or because of some limitation, someone can't do what they want to do to the extent they want to do it. But to look at what aspect of that can you incorporate right now, today, start doing that. That's why you want to be alive. And then that, that reason that you want to be alive then becomes the force that pulls you into health. And I, and I love that. And I, and I love, you know, that's like you were saying, it's like my model shifted, you know, so many years ago. Was it stopping this negative, you know, despair cycle and, and just going from bad to worse in the healthcare system? And it started being like, what can I do? What brings me joy? What brings me a sense of ease and comfort and health? Yeah, well, so that's, you're pointing to something really important, which is to do any of this work, let's say, to change anything, to modify anything in our lives, to just follow a plan, a path, takes effort. That effort takes energy. And so where does that energy come from? Certainly when people are not as well as they would like, one of the important things that they describe, and it's almost sort of universal, is a lack of energy. And so when you already have limited energy, and now you need to do more, there's more of a hill to climb, where do you get the additional energy? And that juice comes from reconnecting and getting clear on your life's purpose. Why do you want to be healthy then is that question, which asks that question for each person, because that's the motivating force. And that's where the source is for the energy that you need. If you connect to your purpose and have a reason for living, most people can find the way. At least that's the very important first step. And that's why I do ask that question right up front, because I want to know, of course, I know why people don't want their pain. I know people don't want a disease and their life shortened. That's, that I agree with. I, I feel it myself. Um, it, it's sort of something, you know, is on my list to avoid or to, <laughs> that situation, to minimize. I, I, I understand how important that is, but I also want to know what are you going to do with your life when you get that taken care of? Because that's, that's really how we connect to the value of our being. And then we can take care of ourselves as the precious, cherished individual that we are. A lot of people don't start off there. And so it's very hard to, to take care of something. You're not sure why it's there or you don't really believe in it. And then what I love is that you guide people to combine these things. So if there's two or three things or whatever that they love, combine it. And what was interesting is that you talked about the synergistic effect. It's not just the sum total. So if I'm going on a hike with my boyfriend in you know, a beautiful local state park and we bring with us an organic meal to sit and enjoy on the hike, it's not just that we have the healthy food and you know, spending time with each, other, with each other's cultivating the relationship, and you know, we're getting exercise and we're getting fresh air. It's not just the sum total of those parts, but it's all of those things together then amplifies each one of them in this positive, you know, kind of a snowball effect. And that's what we ended up calling healthy multitasking, which I love that concept, you know, that that people can pile on these ways of feeling good. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, like, why isn't it just the sum total of the parts? What's, what's going on that there's a synergistic effect? Well, it's, it's basically the way catalysts 
lights work in any machine. Uh, you know, there's fuel and, you know, you light a match and you put it next to gasoline and there'll be an explosion. But if you have a catalyst, a catalytic converter is in most cars now, you amplify the, uh, the, the results of those two compounds meeting. And so you may contain it. You may do other things to, to funnel the flow of the force of energy. And so there's ways of adding summation, but then there's ways of amplifying an effect. And in our lives, the equation is not just literally, you know, what's in and what's out. We know this, you know, in another way, people who are very, let's say, weight conscious uh, will count the calories that they put into their body. And then they may also have a machine, let's say a treadmill, that counts the calories of what they expend. And they'll look at those, that equation and they'll say, I'm eating 1,000 calories a day and I'm burning 1,000 calories a day. I should be losing weight or I should at least be staying the same. And they're not. Very often, they're frustrated because they're doing that. These are the numbers and it's still not happening. There's other elements that are at force in play for a biological system as complex as the human being. And not just the biology of the human being, but the quantum physics of the human being, the, the effects of consciousness, the effects of light energy, of the divine source of energy. Um, I want to be careful. I don't want to go too far into it, but the, whatever you might want to call it, there is an energy field that we're immersed in. And we're, we're antenna, receiving antennas for that energy field. And how well we tune to it has a lot to do with how much our signal can be amplified. And when you go into the park, with your boyfriend and you're buying organic food. There's a lot of things other than the list of food and the boyfriend and the park. <laughs> On your mind <laughs> that you actually spent the time to take care of yourself to buy the organic food, that you carved out the time of the day to take that walk, to go and, and sort of bypass the authorities and sneak into the park and to, you know, then to, you know, meet this person to begin with, which took your whole life up until this point to make that work times two. There's so much of the backstory th that is contributing at the moment to what you're experiencing. And so much of that is embedded in memory, is embedded in your mind, and that's an energy part of the energy field in which you're living. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's, it's not a sum equation, which is why you don't have to be perfect, which is why when I developed the Wheel of Health and people say in the book, the first title of the book was 77 questions for skillful living and 77 was the number of questions and people said gee that's a lot of questions and um, you know most people like to list no more than five um, you know so it just got people a little nervous uh, and I understand that just as an aside but the point being is no you don't have to do 77 different things you pick the things that make the most sense for you and you do them because when you put them together in this way the synergy among them if you cover the but I do re emphasize and I do not back away from is that there are seven zones of our health that we need to attend to. And that if we can just put our, a little bit of mind and effort into each of those seven, the synergy among them is so great that you don't have to do the other 72. If you can just do one thing well to treat your body a certain way, let's say it's food, to deal with your mind, let's say it's, you know, sort of nature, to, you know, connect with other people, to have some time devoted to your contemplation of existence, uh, we'll call that spirit, um, to reconsider your life's purpose, to ex spend time with community of like-minded people that support you and make you feel loved, hold, held. Uh, if you do those things, just one thing, and you can healthy multitask, you could do gardening for, or Habitat for Humanity, or any number of these other interesting things that people do and find that one activity could cover so many of those bases that if you do that and you really invest yourself in that, the healing potential is awesome. And this is why it's not just a sum total thing. Now, the opposite is true. If you don't do certain things, then you may not get there. So if your relationships are really in the tank, then no matter how well you eat, no matter how much you pray, no matter how believing you are in other things, you may struggle in your life to feel whole and healthy if you're alone if you are isolated and you're longing for connection. And so these are things that people have to examine for themselves and consider seriously and try to find those things that really will connect the dots for them, that will make 
tie the string together so that this whole wheel, or at least create the spokes, to make them healthy enough so the wheel turns. And that's all it takes. It really just takes that. Then, then I use the other metaphor, which is my garden, which is then the soil is fertile for seeds to be planted. And when the soil, the foundation is fertile, whatever seeds you put into it, let's call it, you know, sort of medication, supplements, food, prayer, you know, psychotherapy, those are seeds. They go into, they're planted in the soil that's now fertile. They're gonna grow. They're gonna fulfill the purpose and their own potential to achieve the goals that you have in mind. And when that goal is about wholeness, particularly wholeness that includes your place on the planet to serve others, to serve nature, to serve the divine, then I think you're gonna be doing well. I love that metaphor and I know actually you prescribe gardening and I remember a very powerful story of a woman who was like on death's door. You found out she actually loved to garden. You got her back into gardening and she completely turned around. I actually had you in mind and want to bring you back on. I started a Facebook group called My Garden of Wellness, which ties into so many things I'd like to try to talk to you about today. So, so moving over a little bit to the coronavirus and what's going on. And to me, this just exposes what is wrong with our medical system and our government. So for me, what I would like to be seeing, I'd like this to be an opportunity to be teaching people preventative medicine. We're being told, okay, wash your hands, stay away from people, wear a mask, and then pretty much hope for the best. But there's so many things you can do. Eating a nutrient-dense diet, tending to all of these different spokes of the slow medicine wheel of health, you know, being out in nature, taking supplements, getting a lot of rest. I started amplifying different aspects, you know, already because I'm healing naturally from cancer. I do so many things that are taking care of my body in a really profound way every day. But then I added some things, you know, like getting extra rest just to make sure my body was super strong. So, so I would, I would like to see more of that. I also have, you know, a whole soapbox about how when you choose to heal holistically, you're on your own. You know, you go conventional medicine, you go surgery, you go pharmaceuticals, which could lead you to being disabled and dependent on the medical system for the rest of your life. Well, that's covered. But if you juice and you stop the growth of cancer like I did, well, that's not covered. That doesn't make any sense to me. And in particular, when we're talking about gardening, that brings me to the topic of nature. So that incident you were talking about that, you know, my boyfriend and I were hanging out for two weeks and didn't really go out. And then we went for a hike and we were surprised to see all the parks were closed. And I was like, what? Because to me, man, if you have an immune compromising thing going on out there that you could potentially get sick, you need to go to nature. In my opinion, that's where you need to be spending your time is getting the sunshine and getting the fresh air. And I understand and I support I want to be clear about that, the whole thing about social distancing. But what bothered me was that rather than get a think tank to figure out, okay, how do we deal with this problem that now people are congregating there and we need to make that not happen, rather than getting a think tank to get creative and you know, super smart about how do we make sure that people are safe while being in nature, I think it's because our medical system and government doesn't value nature as a form of medicine, doesn't value it as here's a way for people to prevent getting coronavirus. Therefore, it was like expendable. Oh, people are congregating? Let's not even spend any time trying to figure this out. Let's just shut it down. You know, in the 70s, when I was a kid, during the OPEC crisis, when there was a gas shortage, there were days that even license plate numbers went to get gas and days that odd license plate numbers went to get gas. The government did a major educational campaign on, you know what, if the store is only four blocks away, why don't you walk? Why don't you take your bike? And it worked. People stopped driving everywhere. So I was just really kind of stunned. Why isn't there that same kind of a value for the necessity of nature? The way there was a value for the necessity of gas, which I think is actually questionable. I mean, we could be biking and walking and so forth, but let's just, you know, let's just not go there for a minute and say, why are we not seeing that as being essential? And, and what happens when we go into this fear place where people are being basically taught, you can't do anything. You can't, if you get sick, just basically pray. Pray that it doesn't hit you hard. Not like, here are some ways to respond 
if you do get hit with it, or here's some ways to prevent it. You know, I'd love to just hear, I know I threw a lot out on the table right now, but I'd love to hear your thoughts because to me, it's just, you know, I'm just, I'm just like sitting here and looking at this system is so broken. Yeah. Well, the system is broken and the advice is strange. You know, it makes sense on some levels, but like many things that come from bureaucracies, there are so many competing voices that in the end, they come up with a plan that's dumbed down quite a bit, you could say. Not because people are dumb, but because they can't themselves wrestle with the more comprehensive, complete understanding. And it reflects the fact that for many years, there's been a broken system. So, and for, in just the same way, our society, in terms of health, globally, is, is not well. The way we treat our planet, the way the quality of our food, the quality of our air and water, um, and the detachment from nature in general is, are all things that have um, led to this moment that we have an epidemic that is preying on people. And while you know, these things existed, you could look 100 years ago and the Spanish flu you know, existed when there was only 2 billion people on the planet and it, you know, we weren't quite as dense and we didn't quite abuse the earth the way we have today, um, it still happened. Plagues have always happened. And so they're, they're going to continue to happen, but we aggravate it. We make it much worse uh, by virtue of the way we've been living all this time. And it's the same bureauc bureaucrats who have been complicit in the de-evolution of our culture and society in terms of our balance. And so, of course, it's no surprise that they would come up with answers to what to do now in the face of the fire that reflects essentially what they've been doing for the last couple of decades, if not longer. So it's, it's, it's unhealthy to begin with, and therefore they are really in a box. Um, and this is, this is, in essence, my work, is to reach people directly. So we've got our bureaucrats. There are certain laws. There are rules. You know, we live in a society. We sort of need to be mindful of them and follow them. But each individual really is um, tasked with taking care of themselves. You have to, as an individual, assess what's right for you and maybe not break the law but get creative in terms of how you can adapt and adjust under the circumstances with the limits that might be imposed upon you and if nature is so vital to you then it may require a very creative solution now there's a different types of creative solutions so there is you know going driving another hour outside the city let's say to a place that's sort of wilderness and isn't closed down. Not everyone have, you know, has the means to do that. Uh, it may not be available, but you know, that's one option. The other, frankly, is to go within. Get a house plant. Sit by a house plant. Get some goldfish. Sit, look at the goldfish. Those are na that's nature. Um, it may be sort of the way people do meditation, you know, there's a big world out there. There's a lot to pay attention to. There's a lot to do, but every once in a while, it's really wholesome to close your eyes and to be still. This confinement may be a blessing in disguise to help people learn about stillness and the inner solace that's available to them more often. And that though there may be those imposed limits that we can rail against, and I think needs to be addressed on our reemergence, which is to emphasize how important nature is for people to get back out there so that they are less vulnerable to begin with. And nature is a big part of it. For now, if the limits are there and people accept what they are, then you don't have to give up on nature. You don't have to give up on nature. Um, you could plant seeds in your house next to a window and watch them grow and plant them in the summer. Um, you could do all sorts of stuff um, people have animals, which are nature. Um, there's the trees blowing in the breeze outside, which one can focus on. What do people do who are confined, let's say, by paralysis, literal paralysis from strokes and other illnesses? Um, do they give up? Do they, are they, by definition, unhealthy? No. But many are because they do give up, because they don't use the available senses and the opportunity to stay whole in the process, presence of a circumstance which is this challenging 
and changes their normal. So I think creativity is the answer to all of this. Each person has to be creative to make sure that they are addressing their core needs, not by breaking the law, getting arrested and thrown into a jail, which is the worst place to be right now. Um, and you know, that's obviously an exaggeration. Um, not to risk your health either by going to a place where there might be a hundred other people doing the same thing and maybe this is not the time to do that. Um, so if you can't get creative and drive the extra hour, then think about how nature can be brought inside. And I wouldn't give up on that. And I think it's so important. It's so important. I love that. And I love how you recognize the different circumstances of people's lives and how to address that in some really simple ways. Because I think that's something, you know, there, there's kind of like the shadow side of the world of holistic healing is there are people who will extol the virtues of some horrific trauma because they're saying, oh, this is great. Now we have this opportunity to X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, well, you can look at the opportunity and seize the moment without negating the horrific impact on people that, you know, someone in a, in a um, you know, better situation socioeconomically is not going to feel the same. So, you know, my heart specifically goes, I, I mean, I live, you know, I'm going to move my head a little bit. I, I live on five acres of forest. So, you know, I don't have to go on a hike. You know, it, it is better for me if I'm going on a long hike, but I have nature. I can be barefoot in the sunshine, touching trees. But what about people who are in cramped apartments with multiple people living there, you know, in, in situations that may be unsafe, you know, the rise of domestic violence is something that's been concerning me recently. And what I love about the way you approached it is it's like, I just wrote this blog post I'm finishing up and it's called, it happened, so now what? And, and one of the things I explore is the core questions that I have asked in my life, which is how, what, what can I do and how can I do it? So instead of saying, I can't fill in the blank, it's like, okay, but what can I do and how can I do it? So even the tiniest of changes, like I love that, get a house plant, like the smallest thing that you can do and just give that your attention, give that your focus. And, and that gives us such liberation because yes, I want the government to be handing out supplements. I want the government to subsidize juicing the way that they subsidize surgery. That's not happening right now. So the question I think, you know, I would say there's actually two questions. One is for ourselves, what can we do now? And then for people who have the means to say, what can I do for someone else? What can I do for my neighbor? Can I buy supplements, you know, and make them accessible to people. You know that this is an opportunity for us not only to look at self-care, but caring for each other because obviously we're interconnected. We can't get out of our houses because we might affect the other person. That's how connected we are. It's, it's so true. This is, this is a time where people are, are being forced in a way to reevaluate their life, their life situation, and how they handle what they have even have what they handle, what they don't have. And this is, since everyone is doing it, more or less, the, one of the things that makes that hard in general to do is that other people seem to be doing better than you and, or are out there and about and they're fine, having fun, whatever. Nobody's doing that now. There's no fear of missing out, you know, that people are having now where, and there's not as much envy. There's some still, like you said, there, there's still a disparage, you know, there, there are big difference between socioeconomically um, privileged people, let's say, or, and people who are deprived. On the other hand, um, it's, it's an important time for everyone to reevaluate. And this may be a time when we do shift the balance between this extreme polarity of have and have not to recognize a little bit more of our common humanity and the necessity to come together a little bit more on some of these models of behavior and design for our society. Design, and, I love that. And the authorities that we put into place to speak for us. Um, this is a time we need to look at. This just didn't get here by accident. You know, and even if it wasn't a lab accident or a nefarious you know, effort by somebody looking to hurt other people, 
let's just say it was nature, a bat in you know, China just somehow got into somebody's soup. This is, um, has happened before and it's gonna happen again. And a lot of people are talking about how we are caught off guard and we're not really prepared. Well, that's, that's fair. And so when we then look at, well, what would preparation look like? It goes back to the beginning of our conversation. Well, what does health look like? What does it take for society to be healthy? What does it take for individuals to be healthy? It's the same thing. When society reflects the health of those individuals who are healthier, we will be more immune to this. We'll be immune not only to the epidemic of the infectious disease itself, but we'll be immune to the concern about confinement and about changes of our life. We are, you know, the Buddhists say, you know, life is always changing. There's no way around that, escaping it. Impermanence is the rule. We tend to think in a, in a funny way, a way to, uh, you know, sort of delude ourselves and we're very complicit by helping each other stay in delusion, but somehow we can control many of these variables, even under the best of times and the best of circumstances, but that is not true. The rich people still get old and die and they still get into accidents and they still suffer. And there are many people who are impoverished in terms of means, and I don't think that that's necessarily ever a good thing, frankly, but they could be healthier. They, I know a lot of people who don't have means who to me, if I was to look at them, I would say, this is a healthy person. And so poverty doesn't define ill health by itself. And so it, makes, it can make it harder for sure to make certain choices that contribute to health and well-being. So I don't wanna completely dissociate the two, but we have to be careful about that. So each individual can do better. And if everybody, if you can just imagine for a moment that everyone takes the opportunity to do a little better than they did six months ago. We're talking about 7 billion people on the planet, all committing to doing a little better in terms of balance in their life, a little bit better in the decision-making, a little bit more sleep, a little bit more wholesome food, a little bit more kindness to others, a little bit more generosity, a little bit more forgiveness, a little bit more whatever you want to say. If everyone did that right now, where would the world be six months from now? I love it. This is what I really hope for. And I think it's happening. I think because everyone is in this boat at the same time, I, that has not happened recently. And I, I don't wanna forget about the people who are being hurt by this though, losing their lives, losing loved ones, because that is catastrophic. Um, but in totality, which could give each person hope, there could be, an outcome here that will protect us in the future and allow each of us who do survive to thrive and to do much better collectively. That's what I am praying for. And that's the basis of my work from the very beginning, which was to help people. I thought maybe it was by giving them the right medicines and giving, you know, hitting the diagnosis nail on the head. Those are all useful. Doctors are right now and nurses and other medical professionals really deserve a lot of kudos. But the Western medical paradigm, on the other hand, other than these emergencies, which is where they're doing really well and we see how valuable they are, but the days in between these problems, frankly, the Western medical paradigm is not that well. Um, and our society is not that well. Our leadership is not that well. We see the faults, we see the holes, we see the failure in production and supply chains. And we see the dynamics between countries, let alone states. Um, and we recognize we're in peril. And so we could pull ourselves together as individuals and then collectively find some good people to, to band together with to change the world, uh, beginning with ourselves. And to do that, we need to be healthy as individuals. And to be healthy as an individual, um, my prescription would be the slow medicine approach, which is the way to take an inventory of how you are and then identify the opportunities you have, get creative with the solutions, to check enough of the boxes to get this wheel turning. I love it. Michael, I love your soul. I love your heart. I love your mind. I'd like to share with people that as long as you've got some downtime, get that book, Slow Medicine, Hope and Healing for Chronic Illness. It is packed with wise guidance on shifting this paradigm internally and collectively. Can you please also tell us uh, you know, slowmedicine.org, people can find out more, but please just tell us, do you, are you having virtual programs now? What are some other ways that people can access your work? Yeah, so I have one virtual program now set up uh, formally, which is on Tuesdays, 
at 12 noon Pacific, uh, which is an Instagram live program that's sponsored by Four Moons Spa in Encinitas, California. So I'm doing that weekly. It's an Ask the Doctor. And I also write a, a sort of a blog of my own. I call it a moon letter because I send it out on the morning of the new moon every month. And today, and when we're recording this, April 22nd is the new moon in addition to being Earth Day. And it's uh, my moon letter went out this morning. It was called The Gift of Confinement. And it's a little piece that I write and it has updates about what I'm doing, where I'm going to be, et cetera. So, and then when I'm now sort of temporarily in California, we normally live in Westchester County, New York, which we will return to in about 10 days. And so right now, I'm, as we're, I'm getting back there, once I get home and settled, I'm going to probably do something more regular, whether it's on Facebook or on Instagram. As Again, so stay in touch with me, you know, in any way. Um, slowmedicine.org, the website will have most of this information. And my email is michael at slowmedicine.org. Um, and send me a note, say hi, ask me a question. I'd love to be part of people's lives to see if I can be helpful. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Michael Finkelstein, the Slow Medicine Doctor at slowmedicine.org. Thank you, Michael, for being my guest today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Great to see you and be with you. Hello, I'm Lulua Chazoom, the host of Zoom with Chazoom for Joyful Living. I'd like to give a shout out to my mom in the afterlife, EJ Chazoom. I wear her art, her rings, her bracelets, her necklaces, her barrettes, while I am having conversations with people on my show. And she was a self-taught artist. She did ceramics, metal, crochet, very brilliant woman. So love you, mommy.